Welcome to the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation's Meet the Scientist monthly webinar series. I'm Dr. Jeff Borenstein, President and CEO of the Foundation and your host for today's webinar. Today, Dr. Gwyneth Zai will present OCD using genome data to predict risk, symptoms, and treatment response. The Brain and Behavior Research Foundation funds the most innovative ideas in neuroscience and psychiatry to better understand the causes and develop, develop new ways to treat brain and behavior disorders. These disorders include addiction, ADHD, anxiety, autism, bipolar disorder, borderline personality disorder, depression, eating disorders, OCD, post-traumatic stress, and schizophrenia. Since 1987, the foundation has awarded more than $430 million to fund more than 6,200 grants around the world. I'm delighted to introduce Dr. Gwyneth Zai. Dr. Zai is assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Toronto. She was a 2016 BBRF Young Investigator. Today's webinar will begin with Dr. Zai's presentation. This will be followed by a question and answer period. To submit your questions, please use the question tab on the control panel. Please feel free to submit your questions anytime. Following the presentation, I will ask as many as possible in the time allotted. And now I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Zai. Gwyneth, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Jeff. It's a pleasure and an honor for the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation to invite me for a webinar today. Today, as mentioned, I will be presenting on obsessive compulsive disorder, short for OCD, using genome data to predict risk, symptoms, and treatment response. And these are some of my affiliations and also grants that I have received, obviously, my NARSAT 2016 Young Investigator Award. I don't have any direct conflict of interest or any financial disclosure. And these are my roles currently at the University of Toronto and at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, as well as I've received salary awards and grants. So today, the learning objectives will include how heterogeneity and complex OCD, the disorder, is, and understanding using genetic approaches to examine the potential role of brain genes in OCD risk and also antidepressants response, and also identifying genetic variations that can contribute to risk of developing OCD and predicting antidepressant response. So first I will introduce what really OCD is and basically uh, understanding why are we looking into the genetic role in OCD. And I will talk about candidate genes and also genome-wide association study then leading to pharmacogenetics, which is pretty much antidepressant response, predictors of antidepressant response, and then what my future plans is, and I will end this presentation with acknowledgement and question and answer period. OCD used to be a category within anxiety disorder back in the 2000s, but since 2013, it has been a separate disorder group called the Obsessive Compulsive and Related Disorders under the DSM-5, given that it's clinically quite distinct and biologically quite distinct from actual anxiety disorders that we observe. We know that OCD is quite complex and can be chronic and severe, often quite debilitating, and it affects about 1% to 3% of the general population. And as the name sounds, it is characterized by either obsessions, which are occurring and persistent unwanted thoughts, images, or urges, or compulsions, 
rituals or repetitive acts that you keep performing in order to reduce the distress or anxiety level associated with the obsession. Or sometimes it can be either one or both of them. So here's some of the examples of obsession. Very clearly, we see a lot of patients who get OCD patients who are exacerbation of their fear of contamination, washing and cleaning rituals due to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But there's also obsessions related to aggressive type of domains, uh, symptoms like, oh, something terrible is going to happen. Uh, I think I might try to harm people even though I don't want to. And also compulsions or repetitive acts and rituals. And as you can see, sometimes the symmetry ordering, making sure everything is in order, all the labels are aligned. Uh, even if it's misaligned, I don't feel right. It has to be there. And on the right side, you can see hoarding. It used to be a symptom of OCD, but it has now become a separate disorder, hoarding disorder. These are some of the symptoms that we see in OCD. And on the left-hand side, it, those are all the obsessions. And on the right-hand side, these are all uh, from the compulsions. And the most common ones are the contamination fear and washing uh, and cleaning rituals. Next would be symmetry and ordering that I just described, and then following with the aggressive type of obsessions and checking rituals, et cetera. And as you can see, OCD tends to present with a wide range of uh, symptoms, different symptoms. So each patient can have their own symptom characteristics that's different from other patients. And when we think about the etiology of OCD, although this talk is going to be within genetics, I think we should always think about the whole biopsychosocial model and the stressor, how stressors, and also how other psychological, social, cultural factors can influence the risks of developing OCD. But today, obviously, I'm going to be concentrating on genetic factors. So just to give you a, a, an overview of what genetic means, and for those who are who have a keen, I guess, knowledge in genetics, you can take a sip of uh, coffee and a snack. I'm just going to go over some of the details. So the the rationale behind genetics of OCD is really coming from family studies. So when you have a family, blood-related relatives, you can see that on the pedigree, so you have the ancestor here, and then followed by the offspring, and then all of the descendants here, you can see that if some of the disease are present throughout the generations, you know that there's something being passed on over time. And so that's how kind of genetic came about doing some family studies. And family studies, uh, we know that obsessive compulsive symptoms are highly familial. And within a family, so within a person who has OCD, it, there's a higher chances of having a family history of another family member with OCD. So nine versus the general population of two and a half percent. And also there is an increase of OCD or obsessive compulsive behavior in the first degree relatives, comparatively speaking. And if the patient has a childhood onset OCD, there tends to be more familiarity. So it tends to have a higher rate of other family members also having uh, OCD versus uh, the adult onset group. Um, but when you think about family study, it's hard to differentiate between genetic and environment. So for example, if you live with a parent who likes to check things all the time, who likes to wash and rewash things, the child probably will develop some uh, the same type of uh, behavior given that they learn from the environment. So sometimes it's very difficult to differentiate. So what we do is the next step is going to twin studies and we have regular siblings that shares 50% uh, of their genetic material and the fraternal twins, meaning that they are, um, they're, they're genetically different twins. Also, it's similar to a sibling sharing 50% of DNA. 
and you have identical, meaning monozygotic twins where they share 100% of their genes together. So in those twin studies, a lot of the times it comes from adoption studies where the twins are separated in two different families. So if the families have no uh, history of uh, OCD, they will still also develop OCD if it's in their genetics, for example. So heritability comes from uh, twin studies, and we know that the heritability of OCD tends to be, has a wide range between 27 to 53%. And we know that monozygotic twins, if one has OCD, the other one is very likely to have OCD as well, 80 to 87% versus the dizygotic twins, which are siblings, are about half. And the adults, as I mentioned, are slightly lower than children onset OCD in children cases. And how do we do genetic studies? So initially, we do specific gene per gene type of study. Uh, because we, we thought initially that OCD is a trait that you know, if we find a single genetic marker, we may be able to determine what is the underlying biological mechanism of OCD. But over time, we know that it, it is, it's very complicated. It's not just a one gene type of a lone risk factor, it's multiple genes. Uh, but initially, we don't have the technology and we did the case controls analysis and studies where we look at a single gene alone. Uh, so we look at comparing uh, patients' populations with OCD versus healthy controls. How often is this risk gene or risk marker? It's more common in OCD patients versus healthy controls. And we do an analysis to see if it's statistically significant. And another type of study is using your own, the, the own family tree. It's called a transmission disequilibrium test. Basically, you have the uh, father and you have the mother and you have an offspring. And you know that the, the child has OCD because they are the, the, um, the, the participants in a research study with OCD. Uh, and you wanted to look at the genetics of the parents to see which of the, the genetic marker is associated more often with OCD being, being transmitted to the offspring. So where do we look here? And so because we know about OCD having a strong genetic component as reported from the, from the twin study and from the family study, uh, we know that it's very complicated, not just biological factors, but also psychosocial cultural factors. Uh, but we know that when we do use treatment of OCD, the first line, most evidence-based treatments are the serotonergic antidepressants. So why not look at the serotonergic system? And we know that the first line add-on medication, the most evidence-based as an add-on medication to boost the effect of an antidepressants are the atypical antipsychotics, which acts on the dopaminergic system. So why don't we look at the dopaminergic system genes? And we know that the, throughout the last couple of decades, uh, more and more consistent and robust finding comes from the glutamatergic system genes. And those are some of the modulator, the glutamatergic modulators, as some of the add-on medication that has been very helpful to treat underlying OCD symptoms. So we look at those three system genes. And here is a schematic of the chromosome. And I've listed some of them, I guess the common and, and most common and studied a single gene that's been associated implicated in uh, OCD. So for example, you have the serotonin that always start with the 5-HT. So serotonin, uh, you have serotonin 1D receptor, serotonin transporter, and then you have the dopamine receptors, uh, and you have the serotonin 2A receptor, and then you have the glutamate transporter, and then some other uh, brain-associated related genes. 
as well as some of the um, uh, neural neuropeptides or neural uh, other neurotransmitter genes, for example. In 2013, uh, there was a meta-analysis of all of the genetic association studies. And basically they found that, you know, again, it's the serotonergic system genes that pop up when they group all of the studies together and do a combined study of all the, the, uh, the candidate gene study related to, for example, uh, the serotonin 2A receptor, then they found that the combined effect it's positive. And these are also, this is also the serotonin transporter gene. And you have the COMT, um, the, the, mono, uh, the monomine oxidase gene here, and also the glutamatergic system gene here. And obviously there are other types of studies and a more extensive meta-analysis of the uh, glutamatergic transporter gene SLC1A1 was later shown to be negative. So they have they actually cover more of this gene and found that it was not positive at the time. And so moving away from the candidate single gene, we look at genome wide association study in the last decade or so. Basically, you're looking at the entire genome to see if there's any signal that pops up that can be associated with the diagnosis of OCD. And the results, usually you have a graph from the Manhattan plot, and you wanted to see this tower. So anything that goes above the red line is significant. Um, and you want to see, like, if you want to see one, we call it, well, because I'm from Toronto, we call it the CN Tower, but it's actually a Manhattan plot. And so there has been a number of different GWAS study in OCD, and the first one was published in 2012. And as you can see that, you know, there's a lot of different types of uh, markers that, uh, that were a trend. Uh, because if we're looking at the whole entire genome, there's a lot of testing done and you have to correct for multiple comparison because by chance alone, you will have a positive finding if you don't correct for it. Uh, and basically these are the top hits. There's no genome-wide significance, but there, there is a top hit because the cases were about 1,500. And the top hits, as you can see, there is one glutamatergic system, so glutamate receptor 2 that's pop up. Uh, this one is also very closely related to the uh, glutamate transporter linked gene, and also some of the other genes. We it hasn't never been really associated with OCD or any other psychiatric disorders, but it, it did pop up. And so uh, more studies uh, have come up including another GWAS study, a separate one back in 2015, and show that there is a single, um, I guess, markers that is closely, uh, not genome-wide significance, but it's also, again, a glutamatergic system gene. And this one has a, it's about, four, again, 1,400 cases. and. And one of the top hits is called the protein tyranase phosphatase receptor type 2, a uh, type D. And you may wish to remember this because it will come up again later on. And when we have two GWAS, we want to combine the data together to look at it to increase sample size. And in 2018, we did a meta-analysis with the consortium. And here, uh, although, again, because of the number of cases still we haven't reached the genome significance, but there are some interesting findings. Again, glutamate, tergic system gene seems to be popping up over and over again. Um, and besides looking at the actual disease population, uh, as I mentioned, there are people who have a bit of obsessive compulsive behaviors, but they are subclinical. They're not like really clinically presented as OCD yet. And so it's easier to, to recruit because um, 
you recruit from the healthy population and you ask you know questionnaires whether they have these repetitive behaviors and so in the netherland registry they had recruited just just under 7000 individuals and found one genome wide significance in one of the gene or mild cell enhancer factor 2b uh, and then in toronto the spit for science which are geared towards youth almost 16,000 uh, 16, youth also found another genome wide significance. And this one was the second G was that was the top hit. And this one was the significant gene uh, that was very recently published back in January of this year. And so what my goal is really to, to look at how heterogeneous OCD is and separate them out so that we know which specific gene is associated with which category within OCD. So we can look at, well, is there a family history of OCD, the severity of OCD, the age of onset of OCD, the different subtypes of OCD, uh, treatment response and tolerability related to treatment of OCD, and also a cognitive deficit, which is what I was funded from the NARSAT Young Investigator Award to be completing. And so for our, we know that from a clinical characteristic of OCD is highly heterogeneous. And the clinical phenomenology includes, you know, if there's a gender difference, the age of onset, when they first met the diagnosis criteria, we usually use the Y, Yale Brown Obsessive Compulsive Symptoms, the scale symptom checklist for determining the symptom subtype and also severity, as well as other psychiatric comorbidities that often come along with OCD and family history of other types of obsessive compulsive and related disorders and also antidepressant response. And in my cohort of patients population, uh, that I've been working very closely with one of my mentor, Dr. Peggy Richter. Uh, she has recruited over 500 OCD participants with uh, family members as well. So we can look at family studies and also case control studies as well. So for gender, uh, we know that um, there is some differences in the literature between the gender within OCD. Uh, males tend to have a in, in, more insidious, slow, gradual onset, more chronic courses and more severe and more symptom subtype of aggressive sexual religious checking, ordering or hoarding uh, symptom domain of OCD. And this tends to be uh, looked at more associated with these uh, um, the glutamate transporter gene, the brain-derived neurotrophic factor gene, and the COMT gene, whereas the female tends to be more abrupt onset, more episodic waxing and weaning course, tends to have less severe course of the illness, and more contamination, cleaning, and somatic symptom subtype of OCD. And this one also is associated with uh, BDNF, uh, and track two and com T gene. These are from the, I guess, from the literature. And age of onset usually are separated uh, early, as early as before 18 or after 18, depending on the literature where you read it. Uh, and early onset tends to have more comorbidities. So for example, tends to have more Tourette's, tends to have more ADHD symptoms. Uh, more family history, as I mentioned, more severe course of illness, and more impairment and poorer prognosis. Whereas later onset tends to be more acute, episodic, and tends to be more associated with the um, with anxiety and depression. And these are some of the findings, genetic findings, uh, in the literature that's associated with again the glutamate transporter or the serotonin 2A receptors or COMT. An antidepressant response is separated between responder to an antidepressant versus not responding to an antidepressant. And we know that there might be some clinical differences in these groups uh, from the literature, including, so for responders, they tend to be, have a gradual onset and later onset of OCD symptoms intermittent waxing and weaning course of illness tends to be less severe and the responders tend to have 
it's been treatment naive, meaning absence of previous treatment. So they've never been treated before. When you give them an antidepressant, they tend to respond better. Whereas the non-responders tend to be earlier onset. As I mentioned, earlier onset tends to have a poorer prognosis. Uh, and again, any uh, patients with hoarding symptoms tend to be harder to treat with an antidepressant. And especially for, for OCD, there are specifiers ra rating for um, people who have good or fair insight versus poor insight, where they lose the insight in knowing that some of these behaviors, some of these thinking styles are, um, are irrational. And so when you come to be more severe, you lose the insight and become more delusional. And then those who are associated with depression also hard to treat. And these are some of the, from the literature, these are some of the candidate genes that have, have been associated with antidepressant response. So I've been conducting three different types of studies. One is basically a candidate gene studies. Uh, we did have a, a number, almost 500 OCD participants with family members, uh, the first one. And the second one is a genome-wide association studies, meaning that we just look at across the whole genome. And the last would be pharmacogenetics, looking at the uh, genetics of antidepressant response. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the first study. So this is the cohort of participants that we have, and this is just an overview of all the comorbidities that we see. So the most significant would be hoarding. So we, we did actually, you know, even though we recruited these patients uh, before, uh, a lot before 2000, but we did have a specifier specifically noting whether they have hoarding symptoms or not. And we noted that, you know, almost, uh, a third of them have hoarding symptoms. SPD or skin picking disorder. BDD is a body dysmorphic disorder. Ticks, trichotillomania, hair pulling disorder. And then the next big group of symptoms or of cluster of diagnosis are the anxiety disorders, as you can see. The biggest probably other psychiatric disorder is social anxiety disorder. And then you have the specific phobia, generalized anxiety disorder, panic disorder, agoraphobia. And then the next one is the depression, major depressive disorder at 22%. Dysthymia, which are the uh, persistent depression, and then bipolar disorder for 1.6%. And then you have the other associated dis um, disorders like ADHD, substance, et cetera, in our cohort of participants. And we also did, because there are so many different types of uh, different wide range variety of symptoms, presentations in, in the participants, we grouped them into, we did a factor analysis to group them into five factor of symptom domain um, using an, a statistical analysis, using a, a, a principal component analysis. And here we see that the, which actually makes sense that the somatic type of uh, obsession is associated with somatic compulsions would be the last factor. Fear of contamination would be correlated with the cleaning, which is a factor four. And then you have the hoarding, which is now separate, but it's a separate factor, separate uh, factor three. And then you have the religious sexual aggressive obsessions associated with some of the aggressive type of checking behaviors. And then you have the symmetry, ordering, repeating, counting, and checking all for factor one. So it kind of um, push it down into just five complete symptom domain. And also we looked at the age of onset and we see that there's kind of three different normal, three separate normal distribution based on the age of onset which is quite similar to like having a early age of onset versus a much later early onset group of uh, participants. And so here we, we basically look at the extreme, the early onset, uh, but before age eight and then beyond 18 as the late age of onset group. Uh, and as you can see that the earlier onset for, from our uh, 
from our sample tends to have more symmetry order contamination cleaning symptoms, whereas the later onset tends to have less of them. And here for the specific candidate genes that I looked at, uh, which I have chosen based on what other candidate genes have previously been associated with OCD, and also getting some of the information from the first GWAS uh, ever been published in OCD. And so these are the two specific genes that seems to be um, have associated with either early or late onset group. And so the next big study is the genome-wide association study. And we have, after we do all the cleaning, uh, I think we're down to about 200 OCD participants. And here, <laughs> this is the Manhattan plot that you can see here. This is the significant level here. And as you can see, you can't really see anything going up as tall as the CN Tower here. But there's some interesting type of peaks here and there, and this one is on chromosome 9, which is where some of the glutamatergic system gene lies, uh, but it's negative, obviously. I don't think that we have enough sample after uh, quality control. And so pharmacogenetics, one of the most interesting aspects of pharmacogenetics is really how uh, translatable it is into clinical practice. And one of the reasons why we wanted to look at that is because while we, we are looking at the serotonergic, dopaminergic, and glutamate system gene anyway for the risk of developing OCD, but it, it, it kind of makes sense if we look at these, two, these candidate genes in antidepressant response because that is the mechanism of action for the antidepressants or the, the other... Uh, I guess that the other medications that we usually treat people with OCD. And we know for a fact that about half of the patients do not typically respond to the first antidepressant. So there must be a reason why. And we know that clinical and demo, uh, demi, uh, uh, demographic factors can influence drug response, but not to the point of 50%. And so one of my study is looking at the, not just the functional, uh, the, the exome type of gene regulation, but, make, but also looking at the functional into the intronic or the promoter region or the three prime untranslated regions of the genome that usually have a function to regulate the genes, regulates the proteins, for example. And so that's where I was focusing on back in uh, 2013. And so when we look at pharmacogenetics or when we look at drug response, we do want to look at both the pharmacodynamic, which is the brain how the brain reacts to the medication and pharmacokinetic. It's how the liver metabolize the medication. And also, obviously, there are environmental factors that can alter the how response and side effects occur in medications, including diet, smoking status, and also uh, ethnicity or ancestry. But today I'm going to focus on the brain candidate since we've been looking at the brain candidate, but you cannot disregard the other factors as well. And so uh, a number of years ago, we did a survey with the medical students and undergraduate students uh, across Ontario and asked them whether they would like to see whether they're in agreement of pharmacogenetic testing. So, you know, whether it is they, they would like to see it happening for Huntington's disease, for example, or uh, because we don't we we don't have an actual genes for depression, for example, or would you like to know that your risk has increased by two and a half times, for example, and versus whether you would like to see um, if you're going to respond to a medication better or have less side effects from the medication. And as you can see, most of the, most of the other would say no to Huntington's or depression, but 90% are in agreement that 
pharmacogenetic testing probably has some benefit uh, from a clinical perspective. And so really, when we look at pharmacogenetics, we wanted to look at the entire population and see how your DNA affects your response to medication. And you want to kind of separate them out into four different categories. So you want to choose the pa patients who are in this category safe and effective to take the medication, meaning that they're going to most likely respond and less likely to develop side effects, right? So you want to avoid, yes, it's safe to take them, but if there's no response, and you want to also avoid people who develop significant intolerable side effects, and obviously the last group would absolutely avoid if you don't, if it's, you know, if, if it's not effective and it's not safe, um, and if it's not safe and effective, then you want to figure out, is it tolerable or is it manageable by some other means? Or if not, then you have to move on to another uh, a medication or another type of treatment. So this is a summary of uh, most of the pharmacogenetics studies that have been published. And as you can see here, the top two, the CYP2D6, tip 2 d 19 are the liver metabolism gene that commonly metabolizes antidepressants. And then the bottom, these genes are the similar, the same genes that we've been looking at for a risk of OCD, also in antidepressant predictor response. And there are quite limited number of studies, and there's no really robust findings and not, not a whole lot of replications. And as you can see, sample size are not that great. Uh, and there has been one genome-wide association study of antidepressant response that's published in 2015 uh, with oh, just over 800 OCD participants with antidepressant response as non-responder versus responder. Um, and they found one genome-wide significant gene in the this one gene and some other top candidate genes here, also in the glutamatergic system, GRIN2B. And we follow up with a replication study of a candidate gene specifically looking at the this one gene, uh, but was found to be uh, negative back in 2018. And there hasn't been another, I guess, G was of uh, drug response so far in OCD, but you know we're working on that. Uh, so the study is really a candidate gene study. We have after we collected all the data um, and see if the data are usable because we can only use the the data with adequate trials of antidepressants and it turns out to be just uh, over 200 samples in the end. And it's subdivided into responders versus non-responders. And these are just some details of uh, how we collect them, the assessment that we did using the structure interview and using the, obviously the Y box to confirm the response. But basically, for responder versus non-responder, we use the clinical uh, clinical global um, uh, index of uh, improvement scale to rate them. And obviously, uh, we did also use the candidate gene approach using the literature as well as from the first G was. And so in the end, we have just over 200 people. And then on the left is some demographics. And on the right, are so the, these are some candidates that we have chosen based on the functionality of the actual variations themselves. And here is the result section. As you can see, the red line is right in the middle. This is the p-value of 0.05. But as I already alluded to, because we tested so many different markers, uh, we do have to correct for multiple comparisons. So the red line is actually all the way up to the top. Uh, so although nothing reaches to the uh, to the multiple comparison, but as you can see, there's three different markers, three different genes that pops up. One is the serotonin 1B receptor and serotonin 2A, which makes sense because serotonin 2A actually keeps popping up 
for antidepressant response in depression studies. And there has been a lot more studies in depression than OCD. And FAM2 is one of the top hits from the first GWAS. I don't think that it has really come up again since the first GWAS. Uh, this one is associated with obesity, but not in psychiatric disorder. So, and so my goal is the, to to summarize all the results that I have so far. Is really trying to see how complex OCD is, and want to break it down into more homogeneous subgroup, and look at the differences in specific genetic factors associated with specific symptom. For example, you have here the aggressive type of symptoms associated uh, with OCD, uh, possibly related to the glutamatergic system genes. Um, and then the serotonin receptors genes or serotonin transporter tends to be more associated with antidepressant response, which is understandable and reasonable. Uh, the glutamatergic system gene tends to be related to symptom and also family history of other obsessive compulsive related disorders, for example, family history of trichotillomania or hair pulling or family history of body dysmorphic disorder. Uh, and the other two genes are from the first GWAS and it may be associated with age of onset and other areas of OCD. But one interesting to note is really the middle one is BDNF or brain derived neurotrophic factor gene. It comes up time and time again across all psychiatric disorders. And as you can see here, is a, my study kind of implicated that it's, it's actually associated with different subtypes of OCD symptoms and also associated with uh, participants who have a comorbidity with anxiety and mood disorders and other obsessive compulsive and related disorders. So it seems like it's more has a more pleiotrophic role across psychiatric disorders rather than being a specific genetic factor associated with OCD. So in summary, I hope that I highlighted how complex and how heterogeneous OCD as a diagnosis is. And we know that it's quite clinically heterogeneous because of patients can present with so many different types of different symptom domains. And we know also that in genetic study, ancestry and ethnicities are quite important when we look at genetic markers. Uh, so a lot of the study have excluded or actually do stratification model and concentrated on Caucasian. And now we're trying to recruit other types of population, including Asians, African-Americans, to see what are the differences. And we know that there is, a, a, for, for a fact, that there is a difference in antidepressant response, for example. Um, and also we know that the most promising results came, also came from two different system genes. One is serotonin, which makes sense because serotonergic system genes acts on, the medication acts on the serotonergic system, neurotransmitter systems. And also glutamate system tends to be the most robust mechanistic etiological mechanism within OCD time and time again in genetics, in imaging, in different areas of, um, of OCD research uh, seems to be popping up. But one of the, the, the most significant limitations is really the sample size. And that's why we, you know, we work very closely with the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium in hope to really use international effort to increase the sample of the OCD participants so that when we do a GWAS, we're going into our third wave of GWAS to increase the sample size. Hopefully we'll find some uh, multiple genes that may be associated with OCD. And also when we're looking across the genome, we have to think about multiple comparison as well. And besides looking at just the single gene at a time or single genome at a time, also wanted to look at gene-gene interaction. 
and also gene environmental environment, environment interactions. So that is something in the mix. And so for future directions, I'm hoping to look into cognitive deficits or, or specific cognitive domains that has been associated with OCD, including cognitive flexi inflexibility and motor disinhibition, and that's currently underway. And also treatment response, it, besides antidepressant response, I would like to also look into possibly uh, cognitive behavioral therapy which is one of the, the first line treatment for OCD, a psychological treatment. And there's also different approaches that I would like to include, including a cross disorder approach to examine cognitive measures. So not just looking at OCD, but also across different types of uh, psychiatric disorders, and also uh, using epigenetic biomarkers which is more um, into how, how the methylation, how changes into your genetics, um, what factors that changes your genetics, and how it predicts also OCD risk and treatment response. And so I just wanted to uh, firstly acknowledge uh, I have a, a number of mentors, who've been helping me to complete these projects. And I've been supported by, uh, and some of these studies are supported by grants. And also uh, I'm very grateful for the 2016 NARSAT Young Investigator Grant, which has started me on a journey to, uh, as a junior investigator. And lastly, my Toronto colleagues, here, would like to thank them for all the support as well as all of my collaborators. So I can't do it alone. Uh, as you know, all of the studies that I've been completing have been efforts from everyone in Toronto, all my colleagues and collaborators branching out to different areas in imaging and uh, epigenetics, whole genome, whole genome exome sequencing, for example, uh, working into cognitive domains in Cambridge and also looking at differences in ethnicity with the Brazil group. So th thank you very much and also my other collaborators in the International OCD Foundation Genetic Collaborative Group and as well as the PGC of OCD Working Group. And thank you very much and I would like to open for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gwyneth for an excellent presentation um, about OCD and then about the work that you're doing and is being done it around the world and, and your point about all the collaboration is so well taken so important for for this illness and for, for many others um, I want to start a number of people were asking in terms of the pharmacogenetics um, are we at a point that a person can take a blood test and help to determine um, what treatment they should get, what medicine or other type of treatment they should receive? Uh, that's a great question. So there has been a number of recommendations through the CPIC as well as the FDA recommending actually doing a, a pharmacogenetic testing on the liver metabolism enzyme genes, CYP2D6 and CYP2C19. It's only a recommendation now. I think that if for me, I think if you're starting out with a medication and you are you haven't taken a medication before, it's all right to start with that genetic testing. I think once you started not responding to one medication, it may be it may help clinically to um, to do a genetic testing, but. Obviously, it's not covered. I think some insurance company do cover them. Some insurance company don't. And in Toronto, we don't. The government doesn't cover it. So obviously, the patient has to pay out of pocket. And I have, you know, refer some of them to some other private companies to get it done. Uh, but generally speaking, I think it can be very helpful if you've already not respond to medication or you have a quite significant side effects from previous antidepressant treatment response, for example. 
the thank you very very helpful guidance um, and um, you know when we look at the potential of biomarkers such as doing a blood test for the pharmacogenetics are there other biomarkers that potentially would be helpful down the road maybe used in conjunction with the genetics uh, that's a great question. So we're looking at, so not just the genetic, but we're looking at the epigenetic markers as biomarkers, also from the serum or blood. And we also can look at imaging biomarker as well as the cognitive type of biomarker. And so these are really to determine whether it, it can also predict treatment response versus uh, risks of developing OCD, for example. And that's where some of my studies, current studies are looking into. Uh, there's other biomarkers, obviously, like looking at serum level of different chemicals, for example, uh, but there hasn't been one as, I guess, robust. So most of the, I guess, pharmacogenetic studies or implications are more associated with depression, right? So we are really extrapolating this and, and really um, doing the same type of hypothesis uh, gearing towards OCD, which is slightly different, obviously, into how we treat OCD per patient population. So, um, and so the recommendations, obviously, for, for pharmacogenetic testing comes from that. Uh, I think it is, you know, there's definitely more helpful if there's a lot of side effects profile, for example. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you. I want to uh, speak a little bit about the comorbidity issue, um, in, in particular, uh, the relationship between OCD and depression and OCD and anxiety. Could you tell us a little bit more about about what you've found in that and what people should be aware of? So that's a good question. It is very difficult. I mean, I work in a tertiary center, so most of the time we see complex patients, but nowadays we see more, I guess there's, I guess there's more awareness. So I have been seeing more, sim more simple cases of OCD without comorbidities. Uh, but also, as I mentioned, there are quite complex, complicated cases with OCD and anxiety. And as I mentioned from the sample that we've been analyzing, the most common comorbid comorbidity is social anxiety. It's probably the anxiety disorder uh, cluster, right? So um, for treatment, obviously, when we look at medication, it's really the same antidepressant uh, choose the first line for both OCD and anxiety, and you treat the underlying both of the illnesses, right? And for psychotherapy, it's a little bit different because it's targeted, and it has to be targeted for OCD and targeted for the anxiety disorder. And the same thing would be true for depression. Uh, for depression, I mean, it, it is the, the difference in treatment and how patients respond to a medication is different between OCD and depression. So generally speaking, you know, you use a medium dose of antidepressant to treat uh, depression, and you will notice a response at an adequate dose of probably in two weeks or so. But for OCD, you tend to need higher doses and longer duration to notice the difference, have a clinical improvement. So typically, you will use very high dose, even sometimes beyond the whatever I guess federal, the country's a maximum dose for the medication, and it can take up to 10 to 12 weeks for the patient to respond. So those are the challenges, I guess. Yes, yes. Um, thank you, thank you. Let me ask you a little bit about um, uh, TMS, transcranial magnetic stimulation, which has been found to be useful in, in depression and some other conditions. Um, what, is this something that should be considered for people who have OCD? Uh, so that's a great question. Um, there is a, very, I mean, I'm, I don't specifically know a whole lot about TMS, but it is approved for uh, for depression. And it is the deep coil, the specifically deep coil TMS, it's actually approved for acute treatment of OCD in Canada. Uh, but 
the coil itself is extremely expensive. So I don't think any site at this point is actually have treatment available for that. Uh, so it, it can be helpful. And I think we just need more data. And uh, if you if you're thinking about TMS, so a lot of people tend to have uh, poor response to medication or they do have intolerable side effects before they move on to other alternative treatment, including TMS, right? So by the time I guess you move on to the next, there's always a level of treatment resistance that we, we're seeing already. Uh, so definitely, I think it can be helpful, but probably only in a sub subgroup of population of OCD will be beneficial. But thank you. We have a couple of questions asking about um, how does a person who has OCD uh, get involved in the research to sort of help with these numbers that are so important, to, especially in the genome-wide studies? What, what should a person do if they want to be involved um, in the research? Uh, so that's a good question. So currently, I mean, there are flyers that are going around. So sometimes we promote some of the research studies through social media. So Facebook, sometimes even like a GG or Cracklist uh, and through word of mouth. And a, a lot of the big centers, OCD centers tend to have their own internal research group and research studies. So it might be important to maybe call the hospital or call the clinic and see if there's any specific research studies that are running currently. So for example, in Toronto, specifically for OCD, we have a clinical trial for augmentation study um, as an add-on, and we also will be running and piloting uh, a psilocybin study, a psilocybin-assisted uh, CBT study, as well as I'll be running a uh, a pre and post imaging with the treatment study. So pre and post treatment medication, uh, looking at fMRI and cognitive measures. So these are some of the studies that we have in our institution right now for OCD. And there are some other, I guess, uh, research study as well, uh, sometimes involving TMS. There isn't any at this point in Toronto, but uh, for, for PGC is usually for the psychiatric genomic consortium is usually collected through a big research centers that we combine the effort and then send all the samples of DNA to, to the broad. And so you can reach out to the large academic centers and see if there's any specific research studies available. Good, very good advice. So people could really pick out a, a, a center that's as close as possible to where they live in order to uh, see if they could get involved in that yeah. way. Um, well, uh, Gwyneth, I want to thank you so much for the work that you're doing, uh, the work that you're going to continue to do, um, and for joining us today for really a very informative presentation. Thank you very, very much. Thank you I, very much. I, I also want to thank everybody who joined us today um, for the webinar. Um, 100% of all donor contributions for research are invested in our grants to scientists. All the research we fund is made possible through supporters like you. So please consider making a gift by visiting bbrfoundation.org or call 1-800-829-8289. This webinar has been recorded. If you've missed any portion of the presentation or would like to share it with family and friends, please visit the events and webinars page on our website. I hope you'll join us again next month when Dr. Claudia Lugo Candelis, Assistant Professor of Clinical Medical Psychology at Columbia University Medical Center, New York State Psychiatric Institute, will present prenatal exposures and experiences, impact on ch children's early brain development and risk for disease. This webinar will take place on Tuesday, January 11th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. In the meantime, I want to wish everybody happy holidays and happy and healthy New Year and look forward to uh, seeing you again or um, presenting, having a presentation again um, in January. Take care, everybody.